Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life, and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life, and so what we're going to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them, so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life give them information and places to reach out to. So, stay tuned. G'day guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you know, Beacon Fight for Life, we're out to uh, reconnect the Australian multicultural community by way of education on suicide prevention. And today, what we're gonna, t we're gonna talk about is mental illness or mental health. And I'm fortunate enough to be here with Chris Harris. G'day, Chris. Derek, thank you. Yep. Chris, Chris has been, uh, he joined the uh, Min Mineral Resources Limited as the head of mental health. Chris has more than 20 years experience in executive and directorial roles across the mental health sector, including the inaugural mental health advisor to Prince Charles uh, in the UK. He also presented at conferences nationally, internationally, and has co-authored research in peer-reviewed publications. Wow. Uh, that, that sounds like a mouthful in, in introducing that, but Derek, yeah. thank you very much. Really happy to be here. No, thank you for coming, mate. Um, it's not the first time I've met Chris. Chris and I went away to Greenhead to Men's Shed and we did a presentation up there. And I was so impressed with, I mean, Chris is fantastic. and He's a guru of, of mental health. And I, so I've asked him here to come today and, and share that presentation with us. Um, how would you like to start, Chris? Probably how we, we've started, and I, I know that uh, through Beacon Fight for Life, one of the things we want to do is, uh, you know, improve people's awareness around mental health. And yes. uh, for me, it's about how we get people to, to understand and, and kind of make sense of kind of mental health. So uh, it's okay with you. I might kind of just lead off with uh, uh, perhaps right. inviting the, the, the audience into a, a little bit of a riddle or kind of parable. She was with you the moment you were born. She was with you when you first opened your eyes and she was with you when you cried your first tear. She was with you when you took your first steps and she was also with you on your first day of school. Derek, this is where I ask people in the audience, who do you think she is? And who do you think they normally say? I would guess your mother. Your mother. Without fail, people say she is your mother. And then I say she was also with you when you had your first passionate kiss. And this is where people say, hey, it wasn't my mother. Uh, she is not your mother, but she is with you every minute of every day. She is your brain and she is phenomenal, Derek. She's 1.5 kilos, 15 centimetres, and it sits in this thing, this helmet we call our skull. But everything we do in life goes through her. If we want to ride a bike, she turns our legs. If you want to reduce your risk of heart rate, she has to change the chemical so your heart beats less. She is phenomenal. Uh, and part of understanding mental health is wanting people to get excited about what we can do to look after this uh, thing that we call our brain. Yep. By the way, the only reason I call it a she is to get that mother joke in. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I, um, Talking about mental health, do you think we've changed, as a nation, do you think we've changed the way we, we think about mental health? I think we are. Uh, I've heard you, you, you talk, Derek, and um, I can tell you I, I wouldn't have heard a guy talk about mental health in a positive way that you do probably five years ago, definitely not ten years ago. Okay. I think how it's changing, a bit why we uh, talk about like understanding the brain and it as a tissue like a hamstring is, we're starting to view mental health like other areas of health. Yeah. What I mean by that is, okay, if the brain's a tissue, are there things we can do to look after it? Are there things we can do uh, to prevent it becoming ill health? The same as we do with nutrition, obesity, diabetes and all those other things. So we're wanting to remove it from almost like the psychologist's office back out into the community of the, you've got this phenomenal thing, let's talk about how you can look after it before it, it's kind of under pressure. Okay, so how does mental health affect the brain? 
Um, good, good, good question. And uh, when you ask me that, I think like, uh, so, so how, how do we know the brain's been impacted? And um, it's similar to uh, if you have a hamstring strain. Mm -hmm. Because the brain ultimately is made up of cells, which are pretty complex, yep. uh, blood, water, and it's a tissue. Every tissue that we have, whether a hamstring, our heart, uh, or the brain, when it's under pressure, it shows. Yeah. And it's that pressure that we then call mental ill health or a mental health condition. Okay. So part of that is when the brain's under excessive pressure, it starts to show. And some of those things that we see early are where um, it's hard for people to concentrate. It may be difficult for people to make decisions. They know that it's hard to remember things. Even things like uh, it's harder to enjoy things that they normally enjoy. Now, these are the early signs of saying this tissue is under strain. But what we've historically done is just kind of said, oh, it must be me, just push on, rather than recognising, hey, hang on, something's not right here. Mm. Um, so it's, it, it's how to recognise some of those. So do we have to work the brain out? And, and if we do, how do we work it out into our daily routine? Um, there's a couple of points with your question there because one, one, one of the things, because I might sit here and kind of think, oh, we seem to know a lot about the, the brain. Uh, truth be known, uh, we've got a lot to learn about the brain okay. in actual fact. Uh, but the advantage is, is uh, in my area of psychology, understanding the brain, wellness, understanding things how the, we use brain in elite sports people for performance, yep. and that if you stretch this, if you flex it, if you train it, uh, then it's phenomenal what it can do. So part of the area we're going into is this thing called neuroscience or neuropsychology. And what it's doing is kind of learning how we can use the brain for us to perform even better than we're performing. Okay. So when you have asked that question, the same as if, uh, I know you're kind of an elite athlete yourself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, stop uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but what I say that is, is uh, that requires training, dedication. Yeah. Mental health is similar. It's about how we commit to doing things which look after uh, our brain, how we commit to embedding routines around mindfulness, meditation, uh, mm. but also committing to things like, uh, can, I, can I view my life and the world differently? Uh, that adds to my f performance, but uh, it, it, it's uh, a bit like, of, of, uh, you know, and um, the training you do, Derek, it, it, it sounds easier than it is. Yeah. It, it's pretty hard work to yeah. train for events or to look after your physical health, and, and it's hard work with mental health, but the payoffs uh, are, are worth the effort. Are worth the effort. Okay, yeah. so how do we know when the brain is under strain? Similar to like, we've, like we were uh, saying before, is a tissue. Mm -hmm. um, usually it starts with increased stress. Okay. And then with that increased stress comes uh, difficult to concentrate, difficult to um, uh, make decisions, difficult, uh, difficulty in terms of completing things we'd ordinarily complete. And generally we'll lose enjoyment around some things. Now, whenever we're under stress, um, uh, we know that that happens for a short period of time. When it starts to get more intense, so when that level of stress means that somebody's getting so anxious about getting out of the house or uh, they're so anxious they don't want to go into work or uh, that level of unhappiness is getting to a point where you don't want to get out of bed, then that's where it's got to a point where we start to describe it as something like depression or anxiety and where that strain has come to a point mm -hmm. where it's getting in the way of how somebody usually functions. Okay. On that, while well, you're talking about depression, like, is it a myth that well, you, know, you know if someone's broken their arm, right? Because yeah. Because you can yeah. see. Yeah. Yep. Or your leg or finger even. But is it a myth that you, you can't tell if someone's got depression or mental health or that? mental illness? Uh, it is, but, but uh, funny enough, even when I was at the children's home, I can remember this time, I got suckered into this myth. 
I yeah. remember people kind of saying, oh, Chris, but, you know, you can break your arm and uh, then you can see it, but, you know, you can't see if somebody's depressed. I even remember as a young psychologist going, oh, yeah, no, you can't. Now I've realised and through the research that that isn't the case. There's a couple of things around that, Derek. Mm. Uh, one is, is that some physical illnesses, like a broken arm, we can see. But I wouldn't know if you had a heart condition sitting here. Mm. So there's also a lot of physical illnesses that we can't see on the surface. Um, and the same with uh, mental ill health. You may not be able to see it just of somebody sitting there, but actually once you kind of look a little bit closer, or if you had a heart condition and I took you for a run and you were keeling over and uh, I'd kind of go, look, there's something not quite right here. Yeah. Uh, the same as for uh, uh, mental illness we can see it and it's some of those things of our relationships, attention, concentration, we're not functioning how we would normally function. The other great advance that we have uh, is similar to x-rays that we have if there's a broken bone. We're now developing the technologies where we can do scans of having a look of how the brain's functioning. Yeah. And we can have a look at, say, somebody who's functioning normally versus somebody who's depressed and we're starting to identify areas that aren't firing up or lighting up. Now the great thing of that, which is called neuroimaging, is we can then say, what is the treatment uh, to fire up those areas? The same as if we were looking at a broken bone. So we can see mental ill health through how a person's presenting, and we're also starting to develop that technology which will show us what areas of the brain are under strain with certain conditions. And that, to me, that's pretty exciting. Wow, it sounds exciting. Hey, um, you did, you co-authored research in peer review publications. What's that about? Um, in order in, in health to, uh, be able to confidently say a treatment makes a difference is about how you're able to demonstrate that through evidence. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at the COVID vaccine, or maybe that's not a good example at the <laughs> moment, but people have had to show through evidence that, that it works, and that's peer reviewed journals. So a lot of my research in the early days was uh, predominantly through colleagues uh, around eating disorders, but more recently of having a look at understanding uh, suicide. Okay. So you've done work around uh, peer review publications on suicide. What's, what would be your key learning or something that the listeners can understand in, you know, in layman terms? How, could, how would you explain it? Okay. Um, uh, often, again, I tell this, kind of tell this story, which is a true story of wanting to go and buy a dog about 20 years ago. Um, and I went up to Serpentine where a lady was breeding boxer dogs. But when I got up there with these boxer dogs, uh, there was only one left. Uh, and the others had gone about six weeks ago. And this one that was left uh, had epilepsy, was stunted and was on medication. And, and often when I'm presenting again, Derek, I'd ask people, um, what do we normally call the last dog left in the litter? And I don't know if you want to have a go of what we call that last dog. My parents breed dogs, so I know it's the runt. Oh, great, the run of the litter. Yeah. Um, now I've given this presentation, I think in eight countries or more, and without fail, people will say the runt of the litter. And I'm gonna link that to that research, why it's important. Yep. Uh, each one of us from the day we're born, our greatest fear is that we will be the runt of the litter. We don't wanna be the runt of the litter. And that was hardwired in us hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the reason is, is because if we're the runt of the litter, we worry of two things. One is that we'll get left behind. Mm -hmm. And the other is, is that we'll drag the group down. Yeah. And so we all have this fear of being the, being the runt of the litter. So we spend our life trying to belong, fit in, feeling valued. It's hardwired and it's also a survival mechanism. Now what happens in the brain is if the brain gets a sniff of this, what we call the runt of the litter, which is uh, I'm dragging people down, I'm not good enough. Um, even if it's somebody who's achieved great things, I've had people who may earn $500,000 a year and the jobs change to earn $250,000 a year and they start to feel like they're not as valued, they've let people down, or elite football players who are no longer kicking the goals. And it doesn't matter uh, who the person is, but if you get this sniff in the brain, which is being the runt of the litter, it does an interesting thing. It shuts off one survival mechanism. 
And that's a survival mechanism that stops people stepping in front of trains or tying a noose. Because what it says is for the greater good of people, um, take yourself out of it. Yep. And that is a really important thing. Now the second part of this, um, and kind of say, wow, that uh, sounds pretty intense. And I mm. generally will say to people, mm. um, did I buy that dog? What do you think? Did I buy that dog 20 years ago? Tell me. Uh, uh, I did, Derek. <laughs> uh, and that dog lived to be 14. It outgrew the epilepsy. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I tell this story and the moral around this is there's no such thing as the runt of the litter. And okay. what, what I mean by that is everyone has value. Everyone. Uh, and if somebody for some reason doesn't feel that, uh, that they're valued, we've got to let them know or we've let them down. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the greatest antidotes we're thinking, wow, how do we shift that sense of a run to the litter is telling the people we love, the people around us genuinely that they're valued or that we need them. And when that happens, it's very difficult for the brain to switch into this kind of suicide behavior element. Yep. Um, and, and so the simple message out of that is, you know, making sure we're letting people know that they're valued. If somebody yep. doesn't feel valued is to find that value everyone has it or help them find that value help them find the value yeah and that's yeah. part of i know the work you do and uh mm. beacon fight for life that fight for life literally is finding that value mm. uh and, and and fighting for that yeah did you have anything else you wanted to share with us chris um there was a, another one of, one of the other the myths derek that we have is you know around around uh, emotions and often males put them push emotions down and uh Three out of four deaths of suicide are males, and uh, we're trying to figure out why that is. And uh, one, of, one of the things we're starting to understand better is the role of our emotional system. Now, historically, guys may have said emotions are a sign of weakness, or uh, there's something that kind of females might experience, kind of gender-oriented. Uh, now we know that isn't the case. And how we understand emotions are a little bit like an oil light in a car or your battery charger light. Emotions are an inbuilt warning system from the minute that you're born. Mm. They just send you a message when you stray off the happy path. Putting it simply. Like a warning light. A warning light. Yeah. A bit like the oil. So what happens though is that warning light when you stray off the happy path is like, I'm starting to feel stressed. I'm starting to feel anxious, or I'm starting to feel scared, or I'm starting to feel sad. Now, historically, what males predominantly have done have kind of said, push it down. Now, that's similar to covering up the oil light or disregarding your battery charger red light. It's going to end badly, and that's where we see mental ill health. And what we're wanting to do, especially with males, is recognising some of those emotions early and that they're not good or bad. They're just letting us know we're not in the place we want to be in. And yep. then from there is about what can we do to bring yourself back? And that's around looking after our mental health, engaging with people around us and those supports. So okay. changing how we understand emotions more like a warning system mm -hmm. um, rather than linked to your heart or kind of to gender. Okay. So what I, what I normally do here, Chris, is, um, and I'll put you on the spot now, but is what would if someone if someone that's listening or watching is experiencing mental health issues or they know someone that's experiencing mental health issues um do they contact you or can they contact some a network who would you recommend that they they the, what's the first step for them the uh a first step if you're worried about somebody else is to do exactly what derek's just said and it's to share with somebody uh, i'm worried about you um, and somebody generally may say because of that run to the litter mm. Um, often if we say, I think you need help, the first response is, is that, no, I don't. Yeah. Uh, so we want to change how we frame getting that support. And what we want to say to somebody if you're concerned about them is, I'm worried about you. Uh, and I think kind, kind of getting that some, some of that support that will build your strength, because that's what we do if you had a hamstring strain. So we want you to uh, contact, you know, see your GP, see your psychologist. And they say, may say, but I don't need help. I said, no, this is about building your strength, building your resources uh, so that you can be there for, for other people. Also saying to people, which is, 
When you're experiencing the best version of yourself, the great thing is, is that other people get the best version of you as well. So a question we each have to ask ourselves is, uh, am I okay? And if we answer, I don't think I am, it's about saying, what can I do to make sure that, that, that I'm okay? And so we, we look at mental health support, psychologists, uh, similar to physios in that they're part of your team uh, to make sure that you're at your optimum and uh, can make sure you have the strength to deal with the things life throws at you. Okay, so really what I took away from that was when you asked, you know, if you're worried about someone, the way you, you direct the question in a non-confrontal -confront, non 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 way, thank you. <laughs> uh, a non-confrontational way, and then I guess be prepared to listen non-judgmentally. Yep, yeah, very much. And then the doctor and psychologist. Yeah. GP, if they've got their own GP, or help them find one. Yeah. Okay, and um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, so, so I think part of this is, uh, and you asked a question before, rather than viewing kind of uh, mental health, often people think, oh, that's somebody, you know, who's nuts. And uh, mental health is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Mental health is when we're enjoying life, when we're laughing with our kids, when we have energy. And if you're not experienced that, the same as if you've got a, you, you know, a sore hamstring, it's about uh, how do I put things in place that, that make sure I'm laughing with my kids, that I'm enjoying the person that I'm with, that I'm able to go to work and with, with, with energy. So we're wanting to move this towards strength building approach rather than uh, just saying somebody has a problem. Okay. All right, Chris, well, thank you so much for helping me today or joining me today and going through that with me. I really appreciate it. Um, guys, that's a wrap for today. and. Uh, it's Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life, and make sure you take the time to smile today. Thank you very much. <laughs>